All right, thanks everybody for, for joining. And uh, I'll do the preemptive apology for sending out the wrong time zone for the meeting last time. Uh, I am going to blame uh, a smart editor on that one because I was sitting in central time zone and it automatically corrected my ET to a CT. But we're all here today and we're joined by a lot of great people from the supercomputing and Cynet effort. And this is going to be a, a multi-person sort of uh, presentation this week, but we have Hans, Matt, Chris, Brenna, Scott, and some others as well that all represent Cynet uh, last year and this year. And they wanted to present a little bit about what we did at SC22, going over some of the facts and figures of the setup and the demonstrations and the success that we had, and then talking a little bit about the plans for SC23. So I believe Hans is going to kick us off, and then he will hand it off to various speakers during the talk. So I will hand it over to Hans. Sure. Thanks, Jason. We'll see how this goes. Uh, my name is Hans Adelman. I am the SC23 Cynet Chair uh, from Indiana University. And real quick, I thought we'd each introduce ourselves. So Matt? <laughs> Making sure I unmute. Matt Zakaskis. I was the SC22 Cynet Chair last year. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Score with the University of Illinois. Um, I've been on WAN since SC19, and I was the lead. I was the co-lead last year, and I'm co-lead this year. Brenna? My name is Brenna Mead. I was the WAN team co-lead last year, and I'm the WINS co-chair and the NRE co-chair this year. And last but not least, Scott? Hey, so I'm Scott Collard. I uh, was for SC22. I was uh, the NRE co-chair, and uh, this year I'm the SC23 research director. Awesome, thanks, guys. Um, so, real quick, just to get started, I don't know if you've been to SC. You know what SC is? Um, it's kind of it has a very long title, which is why we just call it SC. It's the actual the International Conference for High Performance Computing, Networking, Storage, and Analysis. And just for fun, because it's all the rage, I asked ChatGPT to give me a, a summary of what SC is. So this is kind of it. You know, it talks about we've been around since 1988, although I don't think Synet's that old. I think we started in 92 or 93. Um, but yeah, so anyways, if you haven't been there before, this is kind of a quick overview. And I get to hand it over to Matt to talk about the impressive and amazing things they did at SC22. Awesome. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So um, SC22, we had almost 12,000 attendees, which is a great bounce back after the pandemic. Uh, last year or the year before, it was in St. Louis. It was a hybrid. Actually, last year, or yeah, last year was also hybrid and that there were remote attendees, but sort of in St. Louis, there were most. There was a emphasis on making sure remote attendees were first class, and there were still almost uh, seven uh, sixty seven hundred uh, people there. Uh, SC twenty was all virtual, but uh, back the last time we were in Denver was SC nineteen, and it was almost fourteen thousand people. So the attendance uh, is certainly bounced back. In twenty two, we had three hundred sixty one exhibitors. Just so the conference itself has a uh, exhibition and a uh, technical program. Uh, for the exhibition, there were 361 exhibitors. Um, there are also 200 technical sessions, workshops, birds of feathers, all that kind of good stuff. And to support the whole conference, there are a total of 735 volunteers worldwide. Next slide. And I just wanted to say personally a little bit what I think is different about SC. So the exhibition has uh, suppliers, it's got researchers, it's got funding agencies talking to the researchers and they all come together. And I don't know anywhere else where that happens. And it makes for a really good uh, experience that's, uh, that uh, relates to our community well. Uh, the contributors there that, on, that in general compete to provide products and services all work together to create a solution for Signet every year. And so there are opportunities for interoperability. And I think that's also uh, something I find exciting. And just it has a great set of people working together to create this solution. So um, it, it, it means, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hans. Um, anyway, for me, it just means that I have an opportunity to, to learn new things and try out new stuff. And I just find it very exciting. 
So Signet itself is 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 two things. It's the people and it's the network that the people build that supports the entire conference. And here it says two distinct networks, but they're really glued together. Um, so there's a production network for all the wired and wireless internet access for all the attendees and exhibitors. Um, and it, in the last years with the hybrid, it also provides a bandwidth for live streaming of sessions and workshops. Uh, and then there's the sort of exhibition research side where it, it supports uh, a whole bunch of network research exhibitions, uh, experimental network projects, and just big demonstrations out on the show floor. And on the picture there, that's the equipment that is on the show floor to support all this. That's the front of the knock. Next slide. So the, the, the quick tagline that the people involved uh, like to say, it takes a year to design, a month to build, a week to operate, and one day to tear down. And there'll be a little bit more on that later in this presentation. But um, at, at 22, we had 29 network research experiments on the show floor. There were, of those 700 plus volunteers, 175 of them are from Signet. And they represent 78 different organizations from around the world. Uh, there were 29 contributors loaning $70 million of stuff, hardware, software, and services to make this work. And it all came actually into the convention center, I'm told, in 231 pallets. So on, on, on you know, big, in big trucks. Um, we were able, with all this stuff, to provide five, just over five terabits of wide area network capacity. And, uh, you know, we deploy 450 wireless access points. So the exhibitors and the volunteers and everyone else has uh, a um, uniform experience. Uh, we deployed Wi-Fi 6E for the first time. We also, it turns out, turned out, turned on IPv6 for Wi-Fi clients for the first time. I think there's more on that later as well. Uh, just to support the exhibitions, there are uh, 35 miles of fiber optic cable that goes down and, and, and up and overhead. And there were 3,410 fiber patches that these people put together. And I want to say before we move on, actually, that the um, from my point of view, things just went really, really smoothly last year, and I was really impressed. I think that's to the team. You see them, the ones that were there on Monday afternoon uh, in the picture, um, and uh, just that five terabits of connectivity because we had uh, 400 gigabit connections for the first time, or nah, not for the first time, but a whole bunch of them for the first time. Um, and uh, that allowed us to provide more capacity with fewer connections that were mostly on the RNE network by happenstance, RNE networks, ESNet, Internet2. And I think that made it easier. And we also got tons of praise from the uh, research exhibitors. And I think that was due to the NRE team being really organized and uh, getting its act together last year. So that was really great. Next. So the you know those 175 people, there are actually 14 actually 14 plus teams that make up, and it goes from everything from the WAN transport, uh, uh, which Chris represents, bringing in the capacity from outside to routing, which sets things up on the show floor and gets all all that together, power to supply for it all, uh, architecture and interconnection work together to uh, you know sort of give, provide some. Uh, broad guidelines and, and help bring everything together as a cohesive unit. Um, then there's communications to help get our word out. There's contributor relations because we've got all these exhibitors or all these contributors that are donating things. DevOps keeps us running all year. Wireless and Edge does the does the, uh, the networking to the rest of the convention center and the wireless, obviously. Uh, the, the, the fun research stuff, NRE and XNet, and you know, fiber helps put the fiber down. We've got a help desk. Network security is a big thing because we don't want our exhibitors to be um, hacked while we're there, nor do we want the whole network with its very large capacity to be able to be a denial of service platform. So next slide. So this is this is the architecture diagram, the baby picture for Signet. And you can see the that Learn provided capacity, ESNet, Internet2, Verizon helped out this year. Uh, Aurelion and DE Kicks also provided some uh, commodity internet coming in. And the sort of split, you can see it, the right-hand side is the, the, uh, the edge and wireless network, and the left-hand side is for the research. The stuff at the bottom is like, um, there's special things for Caltech and Starlight because there are the big consumers this year, or in 22. 
There's some stuff for an optical experiment on the left, and then the rest of it is Dinox to, to try to distribute the capacity to the rest. And it looks a little bit like a uh, chip, you know, uh, layout diagram. And so the middle there is all secure, the network security stuff. So it's a big part. Actually, that where the where the, the cursor is now, there's a optical switch there, which really helps us with being able to tap things or um, uh, test things along the way. And then there's network security is a big part, as is monitoring, which is up and off to the right. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's basically there's sort of a, a leaf spine here. The the optical taps are really important. Security is really important, and uh, you'll see more about that from individual talks as we go on here. So I think next up is Chris to talk about wide area networking in 22 and what we're doing in 23. Chris. Yep. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah. So as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, Brenna and I were co-leads for WAN uh, last year, and thank you very much to Brenna for because she actually made. Uh, the next few slides for something else and shared them with me. So that helped out quite a bit. Um, this year, uh, I am co-leading uh, with uh, Mike Vlogett from ESNet and Cody Rodermund is uh, our uh, deputy. So here are the facts. Um, I love that this has an exclamation point. These are SS22 WAN facts. Um, yeah, it was very nice that we had 72 strands of fiber installed uh, back in SC18. Um, to the databank pop that, that helped us out a lot. We used uh, 20 of those strands um, to bring in connectivity. And I have a, a little diagram that shows that. 5.01 terabits per second, I believe that is uh, some kind of record. Um, we, were, we were really thrilled to, to break that five terabit uh, line. Nine 400 gig connections um, for having just a couple of the year before, that was, that was really impressive as well. And, Obviously, that was due to our contributors who are listed there, um, and especially our circuit providers. You can go to the next slide, please. Here's our bandwidth map, which shows um, all the different uh, circuits that we brought in and, and from where they came. Um, especially this year, we had uh, two by 400 gig, you know, so uh, we had kind of a two by 400 gig ring there on the right between Dallas and LA McLean, um, which was really cool. It was really fun. Um, and then we had our commodity providers as well that were providing commodity internet. Uh, next. Um, we had a few challenges in Dallas. Um, we had multiple pop sites and these show the distance from the convention center as the crow flies. However, the Equinix pop, the way that the fiber actually went was, I don't know, it did two or three circles around downtown, did a little, uh, Sightseeing tour. Um, so the distance, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the distance was was quite a bit uh, farther um, than it looks like here. Um, to combat that, we put in, we installed some DCI gear. And as everyone's aware, you know, we're having um, everyone's having issues with getting gear, and our vendors are no exception. But they came in at the last minute and got it in, and everything worked great. So that was that was wonderful. It's really nice to work with those vendors, and and they really go out of their way to help us out. Next slide. So this is kind of a eye test, but I wanted to just kind of give an overview. The Stemmons pop site is on the right there where we brought in some um, ESnet, or I'm sorry, yeah, ESnet and I2 systems. And then Ackerd, the uh, main pop site is on the top. Thank you, Hans. Um, where again, we brought in ESnet, I2 and Verizon. And then we had our local providers, DKIX, Aurelion and Learn um, providing commodity internet and a couple other things. Um, it also shows uh, in the knock there, it kind of shows how everything went through that optical switch that Matt mentioned. Um, we brought all the ethernet into that, into that optical switch and then brought it out again um, and even had a couple uh, DWDM, um, uh, DWDM tests going on through that switch. Um, and those seemed to work well. So that was the first time we tried that. And then a list of all our circuits on the right. All right, next slide. Um, yeah, speaking on that optical switch, um, I think this was first used in 2019. Somebody can correct me in the chat if I am wrong. Um, and this optical switch was kind of a game changer. It allows us to remotely reconfigure uh, fiber links. Um, so it acts like sort of like an Ethernet switch does, but we can manually move uh, fiber connections around. And I have a picture here on the next slide that'll probably help that out. Um, the, 
the way what makes this so valuable um, is we can actually loop circuits back on themselves, um, but especially we can set up a WAN circuit. So let's say we have all the WAN circuits on the left there, and then we have all our testing equipment on the right, and maybe the routers are connected in the middle. So when we first are bringing up the WAN circuits, we'll actually use this switch to connect them to our test equipment. So we'll run 100 gig or 400 gig traffic, make sure that we're not seeing any errors. We'll, set, you know, we'll run that for a couple hours. Once we're happy with that, we'll actually use the optical switch to move that circuit, the WAN circuit to actually connect to the router and normalize the circuit so we can actually start passing production traffic. Um, we have to do this twice because as I, I think we will, show later in the, in the slide deck is we have to move our knock once we've set it up. Um, so we have, to, we have to rerun all those tests. So it's really nice. Um, before we had this optical switch, we would have to physically go over and move each of those patch cables over to the tester and then move it back. And obviously, you know, dealing with that, you have to clean it or scope it and clean it every time you do that. Um, and this, in this way, we can just sit at our desk, bring up the testers, do our tests and, you know, move it back and never have to go over and hopefully never have to go over and clean anything. Um, the optical switch picture here also has a power monitor built into it. So we can make sure that we're seeing good light levels, um, which is really helpful. It also makes sure that you, know, you have your duplexing correct, your receiving light where you expect. And I think that's about all. Yep, thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I will speak to these slides. We didn't decide who was going to do that. But so um, kind of casually um, at SC22 last year during setup, I asked, hey, have we ever done V6 on our wireless network? And that was just a casual ask. And I didn't mean for it to be an edict or anything like that. However, a bunch of really smart folks uh, on wireless routing, NetSec, and a bunch of our teams got together and said, hey, we haven't done that, but it shouldn't be too hard. So they went ahead and turned that up. And, you know, of course, thanks to our, some of our commercial and R&E peers, we were able to have V6 turned up to the world. Um, things just kind of worked, right? And we saw some pretty incredible results. Um, OS 10, Androids, iPhones, they just kind of take V6 default and just work. Of course, we found Windows didn't like stateless auto config but our security folks uh, were able to turn up some uh, DHCP v6 and Windows machines started working right away. So I think we turned this up in less than two days before the show floor opened. It was pretty incredible effort. It's, it's hard to show on just one slide, but it was you know, a multi-team effort over a day and a half. And it's just, it was pretty incredible what they were able to do so quickly. Uh, whoops. So interestingly enough, uh, it was pretty neat, right? So these are some of our monitoring tools. And this year, I hope we'll have a little bit more statistics. We weren't really ready to watch this because it was kind of a last minute thing. But what you can see there is that some points during the day, our connections to the outside world and back were more V6 than they were V4, right? Um, these are connection counts. This wasn't all the time, but it would sit to where, you know, V4, it was V6 and V4 were fighting at, you know, 40, 50, 60% back and forth. Um, and I thought that was really interesting just to show that, you know, most phones and laptops and things like that just pick up V6 and use it by default. Um, did it just work for clients? Like I said, Windows had a bit of an issue. Um, it looks like stateless autoconfig isn't really a full standard yet. And a lot of people implement it differently, uh, which is why Windows was having issues with it. Um, we saw a lot of V6 DNS queries coming out with no answer coming back, which could cause some delays. We didn't hear any complaints, but doing some testing, we saw that there was a slight delay. Some applications will actually ask for v6 and v4 at the same time. Some don't. It didn't seem to be too big a deal for our people. However, it was interesting that there were a lot of requests for v6 DNS names that just weren't being returned. Um, and then, of course, my NetSec folks want us to remember that we need to remember firewall rules for both v4 and v6 and that they can be very different. Um, Scott, I believe this yep. is you. Yeah, so as I mentioned for SC22, uh, I was the NRE co-chair along with uh, Kate Robinson. And so um, NRE is a network research, research exhibition. 
and this is where we get researchers from various uh, institutions, whether it be government, education, research, industry, et cetera. Uh, we get them to submit proposals for demonstrations and experiments that they can run on the show floor at the SC conference that shows uh, innovation in, in things like network hardware, protocols, et cetera. Um, so uh, we, as was mentioned, we got a large number of submissions last year and we accepted 29 uh, proposals. Uh, the, um, the booths that host these demos basically request Signet services to their booths. So um, usually the requests are 10 gig and above, um, some a lot higher than that, um, you know, getting close to, to terabits worth of bandwidth to, to a booth. Uh, which is a, a fun challenge for the uh, for the Signet team to to work through. Um, yeah, but it, it's a lot of it's using projects that need high throughput uh, and private IP space. It's often implemented with uh, with with VLANs uh, through the at layer two through the uh, Signet NOC. And uh, you know, there's there's a lot of collaboration between researchers as well. So there's there's traffic not just coming in uh, from the outside world to the booths, but there's also connectivity between booths on on the show floor as well. So um, Signet helps to put all that together to to make these demonstrations and experiments um, run and be successful. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, there were 29 different accepted experiments or demos, and th those included all sorts of areas. So there was stuff about, you know, high-speed WAN and and uh, and uh, file transfer protocols, uh, programmable packet uh, uh, processing architect uh, architectures, uh, new uh, routing protocols, uh, doing testbed integration through multiple different uh, international test beds. There was stuff about network resiliency and various applications for data intensive science. Uh, there's also stuff on network orchestration, um, so some AI enabled things like DTNs and controller frameworks. Uh, open Rotom was there with open optical networking. There was stuff around um, science flow tagging and sensor networks. Uh, and there was some interesting stuff around edge compute applications and 8K video transfer and, and processing. Uh, and that's not obviously not a complete list, um, just to give you an idea. Um, but yeah, it was uh, we had quite the um, quite the interest in, in involvement in, in NRA last year. Uh, so in order to implement those 29 demos, we actually had 156 different VLANs that were impl implemented across uh, multiple networks. And obviously, the Signet network is just a portion of that. Um, these VLANs have to be implemented through other uh, permanent networks as well to, to get to the um, the on ramps for for Signet. So a lot of a lot of work, uh, not just by Signet but by the entire RNE community. And uh, it's important to note that about 50% of the NRE had had some type of tie to to an international network of some kind. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, uh, so we we do something that. Uh, we call it blow the doors off event. I think Joe Mambretti uh, coined the, the term data tsunami, which I kind of like. So, so I'm going to use that one here. Um, but basically, as the show floor is coming to a close, the, the NRE team works with all the researchers to try to run all the experiments simultaneously or, or as much as possible. We try to coordinate so that people that are using the same WAN resources and are sharing aren't fighting over one another, but basically to try to maximize the, the WAN bandwidth utilization. Uh, and so this year we had a peak capacity of, of nearly five terabits per second uh, during that event at SC22. And you can see that from the graph and the different colors in the graph are, are the uh, different WAN circuits that the, that the traffic's coming in on. So uh, I'm pretty sure that was, that was a record for, for this event. Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the record was before that, but um, we didn't quite make, the, make five terabits, but we, we were pretty close. And then we, we always do something called the uh, the spirit of innovation in Signet, or well, not always. We've done it since SC18. So basically, this is where uh, the management team uh, selects a, a, a team or a um, a project that basically um, you know sh shows uh, oh where are we going here shows some uh, shows innovation basically. Uh, and you know, showing collaboration and cooperation 
for for leading edge solutions to it to a challenging problem. So uh, one of the things that happened this year is we had a, a relatively late request come in from the Japanese teams uh, in order to add a number of of NREs uh, and not just uh, a small amount of bandwidth. This was significant bandwidth. Uh, and so they basically asked for 600 gigabits per second uh, of bandwidth uh, to, to, to be shared across six different demonstrations and, and to use six different uh, uh, trans-Pacific submarine connections to, to reach uh, both Seattle and Los Angeles and then bring them into Denver on the show floor. So this was uh, obviously a, a, put a bit of a strain on Cynet uh, in terms of the, the the people doing the planning and the and the contributors and and all those supporting networks that that help us. But uh, we we're able to configure, get those 45 VLANs configured, and get that 600 gigs of bandwidth through. And and all the demos um, were, were were very successful. So it was um, it was a, a, a proud moment for Cynet. And then finally, the uh, INDIS. So this is the in Innovating the Network for Data Intensive Science Workshop. So this is a workshop that's uh, been around since SC14 in New Orleans. Uh, and so basically, this is a full day workshop that's provided by the Cynet INDIS team. Uh, so they plan it. They uh, find the speakers and the papers to be presented. Um, so it's a full working uh, session. Uh, last year, there was an NRE panel discussion. There were two distinguished speakers from HP Labs Microsoft. Uh, there were six different paper presentations, and there was a featured technical talk from uh, ESNet's Indra Manga on uh, quantum communications. And then it wrapped up with an award ceremony on the end. So um, it, it definitely, uh, Mariam and Anu did a great job last year, and it continued the tradition of being a, a really popular workshop that has um, always drives high attendance. Okay, so uh, moving to SC20 now, real quick, we kind of show what, you know, in some visual pictures and some discussion, what we do, the four phases of Cyanet on site, right? So this, we actually, this is almost a four week process, three and a half week process once we get on site in October, leading up to the show in November. Um, whoops, there we go. So staging. Um, Staging is very important. We get all of the equipment from all of our, you know, whatever that was, $70 million worth of equipment all comes to the convention center. We're not going to, or very rarely have we ever gotten to build anything on the show floor itself. Um, so we have to find a different place in the convention center to not only have this all delivered, but rack and stack it. Uh, and of course, inventory it, which is very important because all of our contributors would like that gear back in the right boxes, right? So we don't want to be sending Juniper gear to Cisco and vice versa. Um, so that part is very important. Um, and rack and stack and power it. Um, sometimes, as you can see in Dallas, we have uh, the gift of space. And sometimes, like in Denver, and what we'll be faced with again this year, is a small, uh, you've all seen them, convention center style room where we have they've actually removed the uh, carpet they brought in power and cooling and we all get nice and close and cozy as we install and rack and stack all this gear um, we configure it we start wan team starts testing all their circuits at this point um, in case there's you know breaks or whatever that they have to work with our contributors to fix um, and we start all that 3000 patches right, that uh, Matt talked about. Um, so this staging event usually lasts about a week, a little bit more than a week. Some of us are there a little bit longer as we're uh, accepting all of the shipments and inventorying it and preparing for the larger team to come in. And uh, after staging, we go away for a week, uh, come back uh, the week right before show, uh, setup week. The rest of the conference kind of shows up on Wednesday of setup week to start building the exhibit floor and getting the rooms ready and preparing the entire conference. We're there a few days early. Uh, we continue what we're doing at staging, patching, testing, and then we prepare for the most critical part of what we do that uh, we talked about, it, uh, Chris talked about a minute ago, moving all of that stuff that we built, configured, and powered on uh, up to the show floor and onto our stage. Um, sometimes we move them in normal passenger elevators. Um, and we do actually, you know, through the week, we're working on the live exhibit floor 
people are showing up building, our researchers show up uh, towards the end of the week. So we're trying to race towards getting everything ready so that we can be ready to help our researchers and the rest of the conference itself as uh, we get closer and closer to show. And like I said, our go live is Saturday of that week. Um, the conference starts Monday morning at 8 a.m. and the exhibit floor opens Monday night. So this is, this is a crunch week for us. Um, and in the middle of crunch week, um, like I said, we have some challenges. We have to move all of this gear. Uh, we've actually started loading it up on a box truck and driving it over to the stage. I think this makes it quite a bit safer than going up through passenger elevators and things like that. You can see uh, some of what we're doing there. And you know, we sometimes have challenges like uh, Jason will show up uh, at the stage last year and found there was a bit of a lake on top of it. Um, so these are just things we have to work through. And like I say, it is our most dangerous intricate, pro intricate process. It does take almost two days to, to do this safely and right. And then we get it all um, moved up to the show floor, the exhibit floor, and we retest everything, make sure it's all powered on, ready to go, and start working with the exhibitors and the rest of the conference to supply network to them. Um, show week. So you know, we build this massive network and then we have to manage, monitor and troubleshoot it and build an entire network operation center that we run for four days, right? So that's, you know, these 175 people, we're not done yet. We, we turn into kind of an operational uh, group for the next three or four days. Uh, we have a real help desk, answering tickets and people on the fly, people can walk up and ask for help. Um, our NRE teams are out working with every one of our researchers to make sure their demonstrations are going right. And of course, uh, we're adapting, changing, and adding as needed to keep up with whatever people are asking us for, whether it's our wireless folks running out and deploying a new AP or you know, even down to troubleshooting printers. Um, and then, of course, just a couple shots here, one of our help desk, and then you know, this is the inside of the knot. So the, the stage with all the equipment is there behind that wall in the far, the far wall. But this is where the 170 some odd people sit and actually become that operation center for the week. And then three or four days later, we tear it all down, pack it all up, make sure all the stuff goes home to the people it's supposed to go home to. And we get out of there as fast as we can. <laughs> we uh, this year, speaking of challenges and last year we did for a little bit, we actually have to leave a portion of our network up, our digital experience team uh actually streams all of the conferences live and they do some editing and also posting on youtube and they need to finish that off before we can actually turn down all of our network um and then friday at 6 p.m of show week is our wrap dinner and then we all go home saturday morning um some challenges we face every year uh we've said you know the entire team is an all-volunteer army right and you know as you can tell this is three or four weeks on on site for all of us, our home institutions. We're very grateful for them supporting us and sending us, um, but it is a hardship on our home institutions as all, you know, network engineers across the R&E field are gone for four weeks straight. You'll know where to find us though, but anyways, we also have uh, some hardware challenges, you know, supply chain, supply chain. It's kind of become a drinking game now, but it is something we still face uh, yearly. Uh, drain demo pools as everybody's trying to pull out of this. Um, sometimes we get beta hardware and that's really cool, right? Our, our wonderful contributors want to show off their latest and greatest on the stage. Um, but sometimes that hardware takes a little bit extra care and feeding to get going. Um, extremely tight time, timeline, as I've said, it, uh, it's a lot of gear and it, you know, even with this many people, it's still not a lot of time. And then of course, network security. I know Matt already spoke to that. But the minute the Cynet network comes up, uh, we start being attacked almost instantly. So we have to have a really crack security team watching out for that. And then of course, you know, we have customer service. We have to be a customer service providing group until the very end of show. Um, and Matt did talk about interop testing. And I did wanna mention that because that is really important, right? Very few places is the network engineer going to get to play with all of this different gear or configure all of this different gear and have it operate together. Um, so there's a lot of experience gained by the network engineers and the other engineers doing the work on the show floor. 
So what's to come for SC23? This is a quick look at the show floor. Um, it's a few weeks old now, and there's the uh, wonderful bear outside. Um, that's actually what the bear is called. I see what you mean, that art installation. Um, and I think that's pretty funny, him looking in. So that's kind of, the, I've turned it on its side because that's where the bear is in relation to uh, the show floor. And you can see our sign at knock here is a pretty big installation on the show floor every year. So if you do come to SC23, do come find us. Um, so big ideas, I was supposed to have some big ideas for what we're gonna do in SC23. We're gonna bring more research and exp experimentation to SciNet. So, you know, NDIS, the NRE, XNet, all of the things folks have talked about, we're trying to make bigger and better. Um, we're bringing back the SciNet Theater as the SciNet Research Exposition. And uh, I've actually, Scott, is in an inaugural position this year as the SciNet research director. So we think this is important enough that we actually have someone on the management team uh, driving the research on the show floor. Um, in that, we actually wanna publish more of our work, blog posts, uh, stuff like that coming out of the community. We found that there, were, there was a lot of interest in what we were doing with IPv6 and how quickly we were able to make it work. So. We're going to, you know, share that, share more with the community to show what we're doing. Uh, make sure, of course, that the contributors and volunteers get a good return on investment. And this year, we are going to uh, look at providing continuing professional education credits to our volunteers. Um, and IPv6, all the things. Uh, we're going to look at some automation, some cloud-based services, maybe even 800 gig this year. And of course, in the middle of all of this, our wonderful DevOps team has a great new uh, internal database management tool for us uh, to install and play with. And this will be the first year that's come on, on board. Um, and then, so you saw uh, Matt's SC22 uh, network diagram. This is our architecture diagram for SC23 in its very version one state. So you can remember back to the 22 version, Here's what it looks like now is 23, and this will, of course, expand to look much more full and diverse as we move forward. Scott, are you taking these? This is Brenna. Oh, hey, Brenna. Hey, Brenna. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brenna. I'm the um, NRE co-chair for SC23. Uh, Debbie Flagger, who is my co-chair, is also on this call. Hi, Debbie. Um, so uh, with Hans's large focus on research and diversifying who is coming to SC and showing off their research, uh, Debbie and I have a very large job this year. Um, so we're still focusing on network related research, but we are extending NRE submissions to include research that's not necessarily directly tied to networking, but could still benefit from the large, the high capacity experimental network that we create. Um, another huge initiative for us this year is the return of the Sinet Theater stage. Um, so this will be an opportunity for R or NRE participants who have their submissions accepted to present at the Sinet Theater, um, not only to members of Sinet, but to all of SC so that people can get an understanding of the type of research that we're doing and why it matters and why we build this um, high performance network to show off this research. Um, submissions are now being accepted. Uh, you should, if you're not on all the email lists, you should get on some of them. Um, but the call for submissions emails are out today. Um, we also have our website. So if you're interested in doing an NRE or know someone who may want to do an NRE, uh, visit our website or look for that email. Um, you will probably see it on one of the many RNE lists over the next week as we um, as they get forwarded out to other lists. Next. Um, we are also, Debbie and I are also the co-chairs for XNet, so experimental networking. So some of the things that we're working on this year, um, we are working on IPv6. Obviously, that's been a big focus of what we talked about today. Um, network automation, specifically with the routing team. We're looking at 5G on the show floor with Verizon. Um, low Earth orbit satellite communication integration, a possible fabric node in the NOC, and also quantum networking. So. Signet teams are putting together XNet proposals, but if any of you know anyone that may um, have an interest in something experimental that would be good for Signet, um, let us know and send us an email and we will be happy to um, talk about that for SC23 or even 24, 25, um, as we wanna make 
sure that we're taking advantage of this experimental network for the use that it's supposed to have. Just a second. Cats. Um, and then we also have Indus. Uh, this will be the 10th edition of the Indus workshop. So in the, the Indus team is working on putting together this program for SC23. Um, so we're looking to take advantage of the Synet Research Exposition, the which is the Synet Theater, um, in order to continue discussions from the Indus workshop that, that may not have been completed or could use more showcasing. Um, some of the things specifically that we as XNet and as Synet want to do with IPv6 this year, uh, v6 only for the Synet Management Network, uh, v6 for clients, both wireless and wired, built into the Synet architecture. Some of these may be stretch goals as we as we um, start to <laughs> start to do this in practice. Uh, better monitoring of what works and what doesn't. Um, and I think one of the main things that we want to come out of this work with V6 is blogs or how to's um, that people can use as resources later when they're doing this at their home institution or uh, with their research project or um, anything else that anyone else that could benefit from this type of information about the RV6 implementation. All right, thanks, Brenna. Um, here are a few of the goals that WAN has for SC23. Um, more bandwidth, more bandwidth, more bandwidth. Um, 800 gig would be awesome. Um, ZR pluggables are uh, in the, are, are coming out and, and a real uh, area of interest right now. So we're hoping we can uh, do some of that. We really want to get a diversity of vendors. Um, obviously, the more the merrier. Uh, we'd love to do interoperability testing. Um, and to that, we would. I would love to see an open rotum um, type of experiment that's actually providing maybe not production traffic, but uh, some type of traffic between one of our pops in the show floor or to the knock or something like that. Um, as people have mentioned previously, there's going to be a fabric node, and so we'll need to provide connectivity for that. And then, um, as Matt mentioned, you know, we have 3,400 fiber patches that we do. Um, the WAN team is uh, typically heavily involved in that, and uh, we want to make sure that's a smooth process and that people are getting those connections on time. So that's another goal is to obviously work with the other teams to make sure that that happens. Um, and then the final highlight for um, SC that we want to make sure that we talk about is WINS, Women in IT Networking at Supercomputing. Uh, I was an SC18 WINS awardee, and there's several other WINS awardees on this call, including past WINS awardees and some from this year. Um, so the Women in IT Networking at SC is a was initially funded by the NSF. Um, that program is actually over, and we are continuing to fund WINS through other mechanisms. It was initially developed to address the gender gap that exists in IT, um, particularly in network engineering and HPC. The program is managed by UCAR, uh, ESNet, and Indiana University. Um, it was originally introduced as a pilot program in, at SC16, uh, but we've had so much success with the program that, uh, as I said, we have SC23 wins awardees on this call and participating this year, and hopefully we'll continue to have participants um, into 24, 25, and beyond. Uh, so the program goals, one of the main program goals is to expand your skill sets, your professional network, communication skills, um, specifically public speaking. Uh, we hope to send our WINS awardees home with applicable skills um, to send back to their home institution, because that's where you'll really be using those skills. This is a three week deep dive, and then you take all of those skills back to your home institution to improve the work that you're doing there. Um, obviously a huge goal of the WINS program is to increase the diversity of the Synet volunteer pool. Um, since SC20, our preference for the WINS program is to try to find applicants that are in historically underrepresented communities in the IT field. Um, so, the final goal of this is obviously to gather metrics and, and take feedback from the mentors and the participants uh, to understand how we can continue to improve the gender diversity within Synet, but also within our the RE community and IT in general. Um, 
and use this feedback and information to develop a sustainable program that will continue to see the type of success that we've seen with WINS over the next five to 10 years. Um, so these are just um, some pictures of the WINS awardees. We pick three to eight people, women per year, uh, to attend SC all three weeks. So staging, setup, is sh and show, as Hans uh, mentioned. We, the WINS awardees are selected by a committee of experts and reviewed and evaluated um, on all the same criteria. And we pick anywhere between three and eight, as I said. Um, not only does it provide technical skills, but um, the women that attend SC grow their personal and professional network. Um, and you also just get access to work with some of the top engineers and not just the r &E community, but also um, leaders within vendor, you know, vendors such as Cisco, contributors, Sienna, people like that from the um, non r &E community. We also do professional development. Uh, so we fund WINS awardees to attend conferences, present at conferences, um, do leadership trainings such as the MORE leadership program. And we also provide um, quarterly alumni calls. So every three months we meet and talk about a, an issue or have a speaker come and talk to us about um, issues related to women in IT. Um, a pretty cool stat. We have quite a few WINS returnees in SINET leadership. Um, we have 16 total WINS awardees that are returning, and we have uh, seven awardees that have been picked for this year, including one deferred that was not able to attend last year. So we're very excited to meet our new cohort of WINS awardees, and we're very, very excited to continue to have WINS awardees return each year. And uh, that's it for today's presentation. Um... We are an all volunteer group. If you're interested, um, funding does come from your own organization, but if you're interested, talk to your management. We're happy to help you talk to your management. Uh, it is like we've said, two to three week commitment on site. Feel free to email me or anyone else on the call. And uh, thank you and thank all the sign at volunteers that are in the audience today. And for those of us that presented. All right, well, thanks everybody for, for going through all of that. Uh, a lot of great information. So I'll remind anybody who does have questions, you can either type them into the chat room, or if you uh, want to just be acknowledged to ask your question verbally, just use the hand feature and I can unmute you. I have a couple that I can sort of get us started with just to, to see the discussion. Um, one of the things that uh, I always learn from going to Signet is, you know, you screw something up once and you often won't ever screw it up again. So I guess I'd like to probably point to Hans first or really anybody else who was speaking. You know, what was an experience that you had at Signet where you really did learn something valuable that you were able to take back to your home institution and, and hopefully for the better uh, uh, instituted uh, so some good change or just a new policy or, or anything along those lines? That is a hard question. I will leave it up to the uh, group if anyone has any good answers to that. Um, what I get out of Signet, surprisingly, is um, the leadership uh, experience, quite honestly. This is um, fairly new for me. I've been a network engineer, network architect for many years, and not really thought about leadership at all until uh, I started volunteering with Signet. So that's been, I think, a huge uh, boon for me personally just being able to learn and grow in that area i can say one thing uh certainly from um you know when i first i mean things are a little different now but when i first started with signet back in 2014 uh, i came from pure r d uh, within sienna and honestly i mean um you know, a lot of people that are that are, you know, doing doing work for features or whatever, you know, they, they don't have a lot of of real world experience of, you know, deploying equipment, uh, installations, uh, working in a pop environment, dealing with cross connects between cages, you know, all this stuff you do in the lab, you just kind of take for granted the connectivity between devices. And so, so for me, that was certainly a big eye opening experience for for someone who um, 
who uh, you know spent spent a lot of time in in the lab in in the industry environment. And um, you know, one thing I really got out of of, of Sinat and tried to share all the lessons that I learned from experience, real world experience, um, back to the R and D team was um, uh, you know that that experience of of doing the installs and and uh, finding issues with the product that you know uh, I otherwise wouldn't have wouldn't have considered. Okay. Well, thank you both. Uh, I got a, another one here that I can throw out and certainly I'm going to ask Hans this first since he's the chair and needs to be put into the barrel a little bit. Uh, oh what's the coolest thing? What's the coolest thing you ever got to experience doing your, your sign at years, either a piece of technology or, or opportunity to, to sort of do something different? Boy, that's a hard one too. I, you know, I really don't know. I think the coolest piece of technology we've, uh, I've gotten to play with, uh, is that optical switch that Chris talked about, you know, um, he was not joking when he said that was a game changer for the wide area network transport team. So having those folks come in and, you know, let us have one of those and show us how it works. And it's just, it, it literally was a game changer. So that's a very neat piece of technology. All right, anybody else wanna give an experience related to that question? So I don't know that it's the coolest technology ever, but I had a great time one year just getting GMPLS to get up between uh, some optical gear and, and uh, Juniper routers and just putting it together and getting it actually running. And I just the and that's sort of the experience that you get to touch things you don't get to touch. You get to, um, you know, combine uh, different vendors that you wouldn't necessarily get to do and, at home and make it all work. And so I think that's sort of the coolest thing. Actually, Matt, that's interesting. I would say, you know, going back to the interop thing, you know, we are one big team, right? And it it's it's sometimes very fun to watch two competing two competing contributors of ours you know, working together to solve a problem, right? Between an interop problem between their gear, you know, and working with us and the, the whole team to make this work. Um, I would also say, you know, it's been, it's been interesting to see the levels of fun and that we've had, you know, uh, sitting in a pop with the CTO of a, a large, one of our large vendors or contributors, you know, working on a piece of gear is not something I ever thought I'd be doing, right? You know, it's just, uh, you know, all different levels of people want to come and volunteer and sign it because I think Matt, to your point, they get to touch the gear and actually be back in it or to Scott's point as well. Um, so that was an interesting, something that has always stuck in my mind. And I mean, it always comes back to the, to the people, right? It's, it's a great community of people. Uh, I, I come back because uh, you know, the, obviously the technology is interesting, uh, but you know, I, I, I I enjoy I enjoy working with with Sina. It's a great great group of people. And it looks and like Chris, Chris Tracy, Tracy is not wrong. Yeah. Yep. Chris Tracy agrees with all of you. Uh, it really is uh, an interesting sociological experiment as well. Watching uh, how other people approach common problems. All right. Well, uh, I'll put out a call again. If there are any other people that want to to ask a question or uh, raise your hand, and I could recognize you, and I'll uh, I'll thank all of our speakers again uh, for for giving time to do this today. We'll make sure that the slides and the video get posted, and then next week's talk is going to be a, a preview of the upcoming release of Perf Sonar version five. We'll have a couple of members of the Perf Sonar development team available. It uh, looks like Debbie we do have a, a question. question from Debbie. So let me. All right, Debbie, go ahead. So my, my question is for Brenna. Do you have to be in WINS to volunteer if you're female? That is a good question, Debbie. You do not have to go through WINS to join Signet. Um, there are a number of ways to get on Signet teams. Um, we also have Signet interest forums, things like that. Really, the mechanism that, that WINS is intended for is to help those who can't get funded to go to sign up by their original institutions or their home institutions to have an opportunity to come and do sign it um, and, and participate because they normally wouldn't be able to. So if you 
are a woman and you just want to join Sina and you believe your institution has funding to send you, um, feel free to just reach out to any of us on this call that have, and we will um, point you to the right um, the right forums and get you on the right teams. But if if it's a funding issue, um, WINS may be an opportunity for you to to um, go to Sinet and and be funded by someone other than your institution. All right, and thanks both of you for for putting that information out there. All right, well, thanks everybody for for being here today. Uh, we'll get this posted, and uh, we'll see some people next week uh, during the personal call. Hope everybody has a good weekend.